Okay, so um, my name is Nia. Um, I work for a company called Into Manchester. Some of you may be aware of Into, um, some of you may not. Um, we're a uh, global organisation. Um, we provide foundation and international year one programmes uh, for international students. So my talk today, um, I've, uh, I've picked a Star Wars theme, so I apologise for those of you who aren't familiar with Star Wars, but I'm a bit of a Star Wars buff. So I'm going to start with the in a galaxy a long, long time ago, far, far away, the pre-COVID era and, and how things were. Uh, and then I'm going to go through the different kind of phases that we've experienced over the last sort of 15 months or so, 14, 15 months. Um, so I've titled them episode one, The Phantom Menace, as this phantom sort of invisible enemy started to uh, approach us. Uh, we had a new hope in September when we thought things might get a bit better. And then the Empire struck back in December, January. And now we're on the phase Return of the Jedi, trying to get back to where we were. Just to give you a bit of context for the, the students that I deal with, um, sorry, um, the map on there, it gives you an idea of the geographical um, sort of distribution of the, the students that we work with. If I just click on it, hopefully it'll let me um, zoom in a little bit. You can see that we have students across pretty much every time zone uh, in the world. So we have to accommodate these students. We've got students in every Middle Eastern country all the way over to uh, Japan and South Korea. We have apparently one student in Papua New Guinea, except he's not, he's, he's moved. Um, so unfortunately we didn't have to deal with that student in a plus 12 time zone. Um, so in a galaxy a long time ago, far, far away, students came to the UK, all of them. They came to our center in Manchester, which is pictured there on the screen. And we did very strange things like packing them all into small rooms where they sat next to one another and spoke to each other face to face. We taught them face to face in the traditional way. Uh, and I think we were quite good at that. Um, so we got very accustomed to that and we didn't actually have a huge digital uh, provision. Um, we, we had a VLE, but it was mainly used as a kind of um, repository of information rather than an interactive digital resource. Um, and the picture there of the halls of residence students would stay in halls of residence, very similar to university students, uh, and would receive you know, as much support as they needed from our welfare teams, generally face to face. It's been passed a cup of tea. Thank you. Um, so episode one then, I think with the picture there of Anakin Skywalker looking rather um, forlorn and on his own, that's how I felt on the 18th of March 2020 when I was told go home and don't come back. Um, I did have a staff laptop but the majority of our staff didn't even have uh, laptops to take home so they were sent home, uh, whatever they had at home they could use to work and, and some staff actually had very little in the way of tech at home. Um, so initially uh, we had our VLE, we didn't have staff laptops, we didn't have any virtual classroom teaching uh, technology, and we certainly weren't experienced online educators. And we were given a target of the 13th of April, we had an extended Easter break, we started the Easter break early, and instead of a two week Easter break, we had a three week Easter break. But we were told on the 13th of April, you need to launch a full online timetable that can be accessed by students in any country in the world, because many of the students had already started to go home, before uh, the official start of lockdown. Obviously we have a lot of Chinese students and Far Eastern students who were getting information from their families saying that there was a huge issue uh, and, and would they come home uh, because they felt it would be the better for them to be together as a family. Um, so my job over that Easter break as the program manager was to get us up and running on virtual classroom tech. So we picked a platform called Bongo Learn as an organization. Uh, the reason we picked Bongo Learn is that it's accessible in all countries around the world. Things like Google Classroom are not accessible in China uh, and we had to think about all those kinds of, um, of issues. We had to completely and utterly re-timetable everything so that it fitted across all time zones and in that time we equipped staff with things like laptops, um, we had to issue 4G dongles to some staff who didn't have uh, very good internet access at home and we had to train staff on the new teaching technology which was obviously very difficult and challenging. We did it though, we did launch on the 13th of April. And this is what we launched. This is the masterpiece. This is the, the giant timetable of doom that myself and my colleague uh, Fergus spent the entire Easter break concocting. Um, so if I just zoom in a little bit on that, my, my portion, the science bit is the green bit. We zoom in, uh, we decided to split the students into, uh, we completely regrouped them. So we split them into groups, uh, letter groups, A, B, C, D, et cetera, based on their time zone. 
the time zone that we, we believe that they were in. And instead of offering them the usual five hours a week of, of live face-to-face um, -face teaching, that just simply didn't fit in um, with the time zone. So we offered them two hours of face-to-face -face, uh, and we uh, put, put in place sort of um, asynchronous activities, very quickly put in place asynchronous activities to fill the other three hours of their time. And we put on weekly drop-ins for students at different times of the day so that they could drop in um, and speak to us if they needed to. Um, we then had the summer, July and August, so uh, a new hope emerged. We thought that we were emerging in July sort of from uh, the worst of it. Uh, things looking a bit more hopeful. We were eating out to help out and all those kinds of things. Uh, and in the summer, we spent the time uh, hopefully quite productively. We put in place a new VLE. We put in place Brightspace. Uh, we got teams in SharePoint properly up and running and integrated so that we could uh, communicate with each other more effectively. And we bought Labster on the back of the advice of this, this group, um, which was wonderful. Um, and we got things like Cloudinary, which is an uploading tool so that you can put uh, really, really big video files up on the VLE without clogging up the VLE uh, memory. And we upgraded Bongo Learn to be uh, more interactive. And so again, in this era of new hope, our students started to arrive and they did start to arrive in person, some of them in the week of the 14th of September. However, we had a number of students who were obviously unable to travel be it because of, um, of restrictions on travel in their home countries or the restrictions that the UK had on travel at the time. So again, we had to have timetabling from everywhere from the minus five GMT to the plus nine. Uh, GMT kind of area and also timetable the students in the UK so we're doing this kind of home and away timetabling we had to manage that simultaneously so uh, we decided to put together umbrella groups um, so we had let's say group S1 science one with an A side and a B side no it's not a, an album by the Beatles an A side and the B side but the A was the online side and B was the UK based um, students and the idea being that the same teacher would look after the umbrella group they teach half half ish approximately of the students online in group A in the morning and then they might teach the group B students in the afternoon but we had to constantly juggle movement of students to and from the UK. So students would arrive. Sometimes they wouldn't tell us in advance that they were arriving. They just turn up and we get an email saying, hi, I'm in Manchester. Can I come to the class tomorrow? And you'd have to suddenly regroup them and stick them in a, uh, in a, a campus based group. Uh, and that was very, very flexible, very, very challenging, but it worked. And so we were doing quite nicely with that. Um, we, the student experience, um, the students fed back that no matter whether they were online or face to face, they felt that they had quite a consistent delivery of material of information. So we feel that the impact on our students has actually been probably much less than um, the, the UK A-level students from what was described in the, the meeting last time. Um, we designed a, a very nice weekly flow of sessions, which I'll show you on a slide in, in the, uh, further on as to how we set the week up so that students didn't have there was no kind of penalty for what, whatever time zone you were in you still got the same consistent experience uh, and we tried to make it easy to transition between the online and the face-to-face -face by having these umbrella groups that students could just move from one side to the other depending on where they'd moved to and from and students reported that the facility to re-watch and redo activities over and again they found really really useful obviously when it's paper-based it's not quite as easy to do that um, what we've not got you know lectures and classes recorded at the moment we record everything so we have pre-recorded lectures all of our live lessons are recorded all of our feedback sessions are recorded as well um, and so students can just click back on the VLE and they can watch back um, whatever it is they've done in previous lessons However, there wasn't always the case that these umbrella groups um, had the right number amount of space. So occasionally we did have to move students to a different umbrella group, uh, which meant changing teacher. Uh, and students don't like changing teacher partway through the academic year. They found that very disruptive. Um, the biggest issues we had, though, is they found it really, really hard to make friends. They felt quite isolated, even those who were in their home countries, because many were living under very, very severe lockdowns, far more uh, stringent lockdowns than the one in the UK, the sort where the military would point a gun at you and tell you to go home ASAP. Um, so they felt very, very isolated. Um, and many students had quite significant pressures at home from their parents, their siblings, the family environment. And we have found quite a lot of what we would describe as inappropriate home situations. But unfortunately, we can't really intervene because the student isn't in the UK. They are over 18, but they're living in a very, very difficult home situation um, that's having an impact on their ability to study. Um, so over, again, in, in, a, in a future slide, I'll explain we've, we've come across some really quite serious challenges that students have experienced that you might not um, be aware of, you might not have thought could, would, would happen. 
Just to give you a flavor of these umbrella groups, then you see on the screen, we've got um, a group timetable that I've just pasted in there. The left hand side is the online version and the uh, right hand side is the face to face version. And the idea being that students could just flip between the two, depending on whether they'd moved to the UK or gone back home. Um, you'll see on the left, all the sessions are online. On the right, some of the sessions are online, um, but um, some of the sessions here, room 207, for example, are physically um, in the center. What we decided to do was to start the week with a one hour lecture for that particular uh, topic or subject. Then they'd have a one hour independent learning session that fed on from the lecture and that could be done asynchronously at any time up until the time on that timetable. So that's like the, the, the latest that they could do it. From IL1, they then went into live lesson one, which was a one hour live lesson, either in an online classroom or face to face. Then they did a second independent lesson, IL2, which again was asynchronous and could be done any time up until the time on the timetable. And that fed into live lesson two, a second hour with the teacher in the, in the online classroom or the face-to-face -face classroom. And then we finished the, uh, the week for that subject with uh, DIRT, dedicated improvement and reflection time. And that's a 20 minute session where all of the work that they've done in those independent lessons and live lessons could sort of be reviewed. The students could reflect back on what they'd done and staff could give them feedback on their work. And that's been quite a positive addition. We've not done the, the dirt sessions like that before. Um, so that, that's something that we're gonna keep uh, and possibly keep them as online uh, even in the future because it just gives that a bit more flexibility. Um, note on the timetable, we had to hold separate sessions for the students in the minus five to minus three time zones because um, you can't timetable them before about one o'clock in the UK afternoon just due to the time difference. So uh, we had to, that was, that was quite onerous on our teaching and on our staffing uh, deployment because there's only very small numbers of students on the American uh, continent. I've just titled this one, A Luddite's Nightmare. Uh, although I'm the science and engineering program manager, my team uh, predominantly are older teachers and their experience of uh, teaching tech, I have to say was rudimentary uh, at the best, I think when it came to March last year. Um, so for many of them, the idea of teaching online was quite frightening uh, and it's taken uh, a lot to get them teaching in a way that is productive and is helpful for the students. Um, the, the, the top image is what you would see as a teacher in our Bongo Learn platform. Uh, hopefully it looks quite familiar to those of you who've been doing online teaching. It sounds uh, weird as Bongo Learn, but you can do the same things in Bongo as you can do in Google, Google Classroom uh, and similar platforms. You've got your, your chat function, uh, you've got an option to make um, polls so you can ask students to answer questions and you can set the poll. There's, there's pre-set pre ones, you know, A, B or C, one, two or three, but you can also set your own poll as well so you can put your own um, answers in there. And you can set up breakout rooms as well, um, as many as you like um, for the students to go into. And on the bottom right, this is the nice shiny new VLE that we've um, we've bought into and we've designed so that everything is integrated all in one place. And again, this for us was quite new. Uh, and for many of the students, they've never used any kind of online teaching technology before. Many of the countries the students come from, you'd be surprised, are very paper based. So particularly the Middle East, most of our Middle Eastern students have got very, very rudimentary um, IT skills. <clears throat> and we're still finding that problem now when they're writing their lab reports, for example, they've never used Excel. Um, to manipulate data. They, they don't know how to produce a graph in Excel. They don't know how to set out a document in Word. They don't know how to import images into their essays, um, et cetera. So um, we've had to do a lot of technical support and, and, and e-support for the students in uh, enabling them to use these technologies as, as well as the teachers. <clears throat> and then we got to December. The empire struck back. Uh, Boris said, go back online uh, for the last few weeks of term. So by the 7th of December, Everything was shut up. We went back online. Uh, many students decided to leave the UK intending to return in January because of the extended period of online teaching, uh, which meant a lot, again, a lot of moving students around uh, groups and things if they'd returned to their home country. Um, I did the timetabling for our second intake. We have a second intake of students in January uh, and we didn't have a Christmas party, which was a terrible shame, uh, something that I, I look forward to every single year. So up until the 23rd of December, I was working on our timetabling ready for December, uh, sorry, for, ja for January, and January came, and there we go, lockdown 3.0 uh, came and kind of kicked us up the backside. So that the timetable that I'd finished on the 23rd of December was thrown out of the window uh, because it was designed for this hybrid face-to-face -face, uh, and online delivery. And I had two days, three days to rewrite the whole thing again for complete, completely online delivery, which I did. Um, 
the problem was we had many students who'd already arrived by the 5th of January, they'd arrived for their January start um, lessons, expecting a face to face delivery uh, programme. And so those students that arrived in time to do their quarantine to finish the quarantine on the 11th of January so that they could come uh, face to face. Uh, and those students were very, very disappointed, obviously, when uh, when the situation uh, happened as it did. And so we had many students who were stranded on their own, isolated, living in single accommodation rooms where under normal circumstances, at least to be able to have come into the centre every day and met their, their um, teachers and their colleagues face to face. So as you might expect, our students have um, experienced a number of welfare, social, personal welfare issues. Um, and particularly it was lockdown 3.0 where these issues started to really uh, come to the forefront and really become obvious. Um, and they started to feed through into our welfare team. Um, some of them might be familiar to if you teach international students, but I think these are reasonably unique um, to the international student. So this is a genuine one I dealt with after the January exams, a student who applied to resit his maths January exam. And his reason for that was he couldn't concentrate during the exam because there was a sniper in the window opposite. And he was fearful um, that, he, that, that obviously he might be shot. Um, he did resit the January exam. <laughs> he resat it in April and he was granted uh, permission to resit. Uh, this is another student who missed the January exams uh, because his father is an op or was an opposition candidate um, and the family were receiving death threats as, re as a result of his father standing for election uh, in one of the African countries. They had to leave the country to stay with relatives who lived in a village where there was no internet connection in a different country. Uh, the next one, the military have shut down all communication networks. This is Myanmar. Um, so we were getting really quite distressing emails from students in Myanmar um, particularly at the beginning of the crackdown there by the military, um, students who've had um, friends and family members arrested or shot. Um, and it wasn't a case of, I can't do my work. It was a case of, can you send me things I can work offline? If you can send me a zip file with a load of stuff in, I'll download it whenever I can and I'll work on it um, offline. And they were really, really keen um, you know, to keep, continue with their course. We did offer them the opportunity to defer um, defer their course to next year. And most of them said, no, we want to try and finish it this year. Um, so you know, they're really, really keen in, in the face of all of these issues, the students are really, really keen to finish their course and get on. This is a really common one and it's one we've really struggled with. Uh, I'm the eldest male, so I'm the guardian for my female relatives. And so in certain countries, it's the law that women can't go out unaccompanied by themselves. And if one of our students happens to be the eldest male in the household, it may be that every time his sister, his mother, his auntie, whoever they live with needs to go to an appointment or go out shopping, they have to go with them. And so that takes them out of class. It takes them away from their lessons. We can't authorise absence for that reason, but we also can't tell them to break the law in their country and not accompany their mother, their sister, etc. So that's a, a big challenge for many students. Uh, and this is one we hadn't really anticipated. My parents expect me to work full time in a family business. Um, so I joined the class on my phone. So we were aware of students um, on market stalls, shops and things. They've just got the, the class open on their phone uh, and they have, it, they have themselves muted and they just kind of grab a, a glance when they can. But they're not interacting with the lesson. Actually, they're just they're there. We call them ghost students. They're there, but they're not there. I'm sure you've come across ghost students, but I think many of you probably think that they're in bed asleep or, or whatever else. Um, many of ours are actually working, um, and, but they can't say, no, I'm not going to work because it's a family business and they haven't really got that option. And this was quite a sad one I dealt with. I'm caring for my grandparents because all my family have COVID-19 and that one finished with all four grandparents also uh, catching COVID and in fact passing away. Um, so students with significant caring responsibilities because of, uh, for example, multi-generational um, living, which I've, I'm sure is quite similar to the UK where there are students with um, you know, caring responsibilities. Anyway, so we, we got through all of that uh, and here we are in May, return of the Jedi I've called it, return of the face-to-face -face teaching from the 17th of May, which I'm sure many of you in HE have managed to go back to at least some face-to-face -face teaching. Um, the issue was that many students had in fact returned to their country in that period of lockdown 3.0, they decided not to hang about in the UK and they decided to go home. So only very small numbers remained in the UK. Another timetable was required to accommodate the fact that we had more online and fewer face-to-face, -face, so another re-timetabling. Um, so uh, coming up in the future, then we're um, we're carrying on with fully um, supervised examinations. So our students will be doing proper exams. There's no teacher assessment um, of our course. So the students will be fully remotely proctored uh, in their exam. They'll be completing digital upload of their work, and we will be marking online. 
Now there's plenty to go wrong there, the remote proctoring being one of them. Um, but the expectation is that the students will do the basically the same exams as they would have done previously, just in a digital format. And it will be uh, quite thoroughly um, checked, you know, invigilated so that they don't cheat. Um, they've continued doing their coursework as normal. They've submitted lab reports and, um, and essays. And they did, as I mentioned before, a January exam. The January exam was open book because the remote proctoring wasn't in place. Uh, but there's been quite a thorough process of academic misconduct identification from that. I've been in meetings all this morning <laughs> regarding academic misconduct. So we are dealing with that very thoroughly as well. Um, so I would say the international student experience then, um, well, I'll mention that in a second, the international student experience have perhaps from our perspective has been better than for the, the UK students. You know, we, we, we feel that we've been able to deliver the same material, the same information, uh, just in a different way, in a different format. Um, something we've been trialing um, in th this new period of teaching from the 17th of May is getting students joining the face to face classes because there's only small numbers face to face, but also online at the same time. So we've been using this high flex method. So the timetable on the board there includes students from the American uh, continent. So all of their live lessons are in the afternoon after the lunch break. We've changed the times of lessons so that the earliest start is two o'clock in the afternoon, which is about eight o'clock in the morning in Ecuador. So that's not a bad time to start your lessons. Uh, and we've invested in these actually quite inexpensive cameras. They're about 50 quid. Um, it's a really, really high res um, camera that can be on a tripod. So you can turn it around very easily. You can show um, the teacher, you can show other students in the room. You can show something that you're doing, maybe an experiment or, or whatever that you might be doing with your hands. And it's got really, really good audio um, linked in with it as well, a good microphone. Um, so we're using that for high flex teaching. So running a bongo learn classroom at the same time that we're doing the face-to-face -face teaching. Um, so what have we learned this year? We've learned a lot. Um, online isn't as bad as we thought it was going to be. We quite like it actually. Um, we thought, you know, we thought we wouldn't like it, um, but we do. Um, being at home doesn't mean students are safe, happy and supported. In fact, we've been really surprised at some of the issues that we've come across um, this year. Um, <laughs> supporting students across time zones in a meaningful way is really hard. Um, so when students are emailing you from Myanmar at 2 a.m. our time with some sort of desperate plea and you happen to have your phone pinging emails at you, it is quite hard to put the phone down uh, and wait till nine o'clock the following morning to deal with that. Um, having lectures online is a brilliant idea and we think that should carry on. Um, so we're going to carry on doing that. Timetabling should definitely be an Olympic sport, and I'd like to put myself forward for the UK uh, entry for that sport. Uh, I feel I might win a gold medal in it. Uh, teams is both a wonderful and a horrific thing because you're constantly attached, and that's with the students as well. So teams is the way we interact with the students outside of class uh, for meetings, support meetings, welfare meetings, all of those things. So we're kind of welded to it constantly. But having amazing colleagues, uh, my team and the students have made it uh, so much easier. Our students have been phenomenal. The amount of disruption that they've had to put, you know, be faced with um, and the amount of new things they've had to learn uh, in such a short time, there's been almost no complaints. Um, students have been really, really accommodating. Um, so that brings me kind of to the end of my presentation. So I'm happy to take any questions or we can do that at the end. I don't know what Nigel's preference is. So I'll, uh, I'll stop the screen share. We've had quite a few questions in the chat. Um, yeah. so please ask, did many or any students defer to this year or suspend during 2021? Yeah, so we've had a number of students who started in September who then decided to defer to January and then regretted it and wished they'd have carried on in September uh, because they didn't realise the obviously we'd have disruption again in January. We have had some deferrals of students who wanted to originally start in January and they've deferred to September. We're being quite strict now on deferrals because we can't, we, we can't just keep deferring people indefinitely. So once they've had, basically, they've, they've tried to start, they've deferred once and they've started again, they can't defer, you know, like a second time. Um, we have been flexible, but, um, you know, it, it's not easy to keep deferring people all the, all the, all the time. Yeah, sure. Uh, Bob asks, did you identify any good strategies for curating or organising content? He said one of the problems that he's found is that as the semester progresses, it's very difficult for students to find content they needed to review because there's simply so much. Yeah, um, so the Brightspace VLE that we're using does have um, a calendar feature and you can make any tasks that you want the students to do in a given week appear on that calendar. So they just click on a particular day and the calendar should show them what it is they need to do. Um, students did find that quite difficult at the beginning. They had to look at their 
when I say paper time, it's PDF timetable. They had to look at the PDF timetable and work out at you know, nine o'clock on a Monday, I should be doing my independent lesson for biology, for example. Um, they found that challenging at the beginning, but once they got in their heads, the order of the week that they should be looking for a lecture towards the beginning of the week, they should be looking for an independent lesson next. Um, they found it quite easy to follow. Um, we've arranged the VLE in uh, week by week tabs. So we've started with week one, with the date and so if they click on a given week on the VLE they should be able to see all of the information that they need for that particular week all of the links to the online lessons are there I mean, I'm happy to do a, if you want me to screen share and show you what, what it looks like I'm happy to do that um, I'm possibly logged in um, but yeah we, we, we found a way of organizing Brightspace so that it was quite um, quite nice and neat I think that the consistency is a key there if you've got the same thing appearing week after week so you can get used to it yeah, and that's something else we decided we teach on the science and engineering students do three academic modules so um, out of biology chemistry physics maths and further maths they do three of three of those modules. Um, I'm just opening the VLE now. Um, <clears throat> so each module we've we've made consistent so we've made a consistent. Um, uh, vision for each one so it looks the same, whether or not they go on their chemistry their biology or their physics, it should look the same. Okay, brilliant. Uh, David asks, how did you set up the e-support? Was it self-service or some sort of workshop based? Okay, so um, when you say e-support, I'm not sure whether you mean the DIRT sessions or whether you mean sort of technical support. So I'll, I'll mention both. The DIRT sessions, which are the, the dedicated improvement and reflection time sessions, they're just like any other online classroom session. There's a, a bungle Learn link set up and the students just sort of present themselves to that. So that was quite easy to set up. Uh, in terms of e-support, we have um, a help desk. So the students go to, I can't remember the website address, but there's a website they go to and there's a help desk button on there. They click on the help desk and then it's uh, triage. You know, they can, from a drop down menu, they can select what kind of assistance. Is it um, admin assistance? Is it student services they need accommodation? Or or is it IT? And we also have a student IT um, email address, so we can uh, either we can refer students if they're emailing us to say uh, my bright space isn't working, I can't log into this, this, that, and the other. We can just forward that email to it support at whatever it is dot com. Copy the student in, and then we can remove ourselves from that help desk ticket and let the help desk deal with the students. So. Um, as I mentioned before, we're, we're a global organisation. Our head office is in Brighton and we have all of our IT support services in Brighton, working remotely mainly at the moment. So the team in Brighton generally pick up the majority of our um, uh, IT so, you know, help desk calls. Um, so that's how we've done that. Yeah. I one of the questions I was going to ask you about is actually is the, whether we need to think, think about scaffolding more IT support for students. Yes. There's been quite a debate about this in, in the chat was saying with many people saying that we don't have digitally native students and people do struggle. But from your experience, from what you're saying about students coming into the UK with very little IT training, is this something yeah. you, you think we should be targeting much more in foundation year, first year? Yes, I think I think um, it's wrong to think that students would automatically know, for example, how to set, how to present a, an, a lab report, how to present an essay, um, how to manipulate things in Excel, as I say, how to make a you know a decent PowerPoint presentation. Um, my understanding is that um, ICT has been taken out of the GCSE and kind of the school options, and it's now there's a computer science GCSE, which is a bit more about coding and program, which is brilliant. But not all students want to go down that level of IT kind of um, stuff, and there's not as much perhaps. Uh, if any colleagues are on the call that are, you know are secondary school teachers, they can correct me if I'm wrong. But there's not as much on on the kind of the mechanics of using a day-to-day -day computer software, and many of our students do come from countries that China you think is, is brilliantly advanced when it comes to IT, and they are in many ways. But in school, everything's paper-based. It's all textbook-based. It's all handwritten. Um, and it's very much very large class sizes, so 40 or 50 students in a class is not uncommon. Um, and it's very much rote learning. The teacher writes on the board, you listen and you write it down and you don't ask any questions. You just listen. And if you ask a question, that's a failing on your part as the student for not understanding the teacher. So that's another thing, uh, kind of slightly separately, is, is uh, appreciating the cultures from, where, from which students come uh, and, and, and enabling them to ask the right questions is, is also a difficult, difficult challenge as well. Um, Sue's asked a question about uh, preventing collusion with different time zones. So have you experienced yes. any of that? 
Um, we set so we have different we have different versions of the assessment. So um, time zone one uh, is all the students in plus time zones. We set the the launch times of uh, assessments to be launched at nine o'clock in the morning. Between nine and eleven o'clock in the morning, they can finish the assessment within a reasonable time scale for their time zone. Um, so that's time zone one. Anybody in a negative time zone, which is time zone two, we launch at about half past one or two in the afternoon, but they sit a different version of the test. Um, so there shouldn't be any collusion in that, in that regard. Okay. Uh, Sarah's asked, have you had any issues of online bullying and has, how has that been dealt with? Um, I have none of that's been brought to my attention. Um, so if we have had any uh, issues like that, we haven't. Uh, last academic year, though, we did have um, some <coughs> issues where a member of staff had left an, an online classroom open and he didn't realise he hadn't ended the session. Um, so he had his camera on and he had his audio on and his wife came into view and he was he ended up saying, oh, yes, I've just finished the lesson. Yeah, give me a sec. And while he was sort of chatting, he didn't say anything inappropriate or do anything in, inappropriate. But as he was chatting to his wife, the comments that were coming in the chat from the students were definitely inappropriate. Um, so they compared his wife's appearance to that of a, a famous adult um, star, basically. Um, and so because the lesson was being recorded, as soon as he ended the lesson, I could go back through the recording. I could see the names of the students who'd made, made the comments and I could go back then. And I did deal with that. that was, so that was last academic year. Um, I called them into a meeting, explained obviously why, <laughs> why they shouldn't do that kind of thing. But I also counseled the teacher to make sure he ended the lesson as soon as he's ready to finish and didn't have a, an extended chit chat at the end. Um, the final question we've had in the chat is for Martin. He said, uh, have you made any attempts to encourage cameras on for online teaching? It was originally our plan to do that. But again, um, learning more about where our students are coming from, even from very wealthy countries, the internet infrastructure is often poor. So if you ask them to keep a, a video stream constantly on during a lesson, they can't receive all the information that you're trying you know if you try to send a document in the chat for example you ask them to go back onto the, the vle and download something or you ask them to watch a video as part of the lesson they just don't have the bandwidth for it um, and it's you know if you do have your students on the market stall in the middle of peshwar or wherever it is they are they don't want to be on camera um, you know a lot of them are in multi-generational households they've got mum granny dad uh, the women don't necessarily want to have their uh, faces on camera um, family members on camera and um, so we decided to scrap that as a mandate the only time i asked them to put cameras on is if i'm doing something like an academic misconduct meeting and i want to be sure that i'm not speaking to you know somebody's parent basically um, doing it for them. I'd like to try and at least ascertain that it is the, the student I've asked to speak to. But then once they've put it on momentarily, they can switch it off once they've established that it is the right person I'm speaking to. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, Nia. I really appreciate that. I think, again, it's given us a lot of things that we need to, to think about from the international perspective as well. Um, so feeds really nicely in with what we were talking about last time with uh, Leia and Hannah. So thank you very much yeah. for taking time to do that. No problem. Um, Hi, Jill. Could I just say something really, really quickly? Yeah. My son's doing um, A-level chemistry and biology here in the UK this, at the moment. He can't use Excel. He's all right with Word, doesn't know how to use PowerPoint. So it isn't just overseas students. So, you know, we've we've done things with him recently and he, I, I'm amazed at how little he knows and he did computer science. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't think it was just an international just student. Science. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, problems across the board, I think, is so whatever we do, I think to support students will be beneficial for everybody, not just tight, trying to target specific groups. I think whatever we do will be will be helpful for all of our students.